I'm continuing to read in the Lies of Free Will. I'm ready for chapter 6. I'm going to try to get through the rest of the book in this reading. Free will, free will lies against a particular redemption or limited atonement. Because of the false doctrine that Jesus Christ died for all men without any exceptions and made it possible for all men to be saved is pretty much taught in over 90% of the so-called churches today. Any preacher that comes along dispelling this lie and teaching what Christ taught himself is labeled a heretic. Christ's sacrifice on the cross was either effective for all for whom he died for or it was not. Those touting the false doctrine of a potential atonement in contrast to effectual atonement, have been left with egg on their face, as it were. One cannot have it both ways. Christ was the perfect sacrifice for whom he died, or he was not, and his death has no power other than to rob him of his glory and give it to the free will of man. There are so many scriptures that prove that Christ died only for his elect, those chosen from the foundation of the world, those who were given to him by his Father before the world Get began. Yes, he definitely came to save his people from their sins and not all the people that were ever created. The ninth chapter of Romans dispels this very notion when it shows us clearly that there are two kinds of people created on earth. The one vessel fitted for honor and loved by God before he was born and the other vessel of wrath fitted for destruction and hated by God before he was born. Notice the language in Romans 9, 11 through 25, for they said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, for he said to Moses, saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power with the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath for the destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory? Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in Ose, I will call them my people which were not my people, and are beloved which were not beloved. This passage of scripture is very clear. God has a people chosen before they are born to be loved, and a people chosen by God before they are born to be hated, and it is all of the, to the glory and purpose of God. Many highly educated people uh, in man's earthly wisdom have tried to explain this passage of scripture to say something totally different than what it clearly conveys. Some say it's referring to nations and not individuals, but Paul clearly points out the individuals' names he's referring to, that is, Jacob and Esau. <clears throat> Others have said it means God loved Esau less than he loved Jacob. No, it clearly says he loved Jacob and hated Esau. Others say it is only referring to the Jews as God's chosen people. No, both Jews and Gentiles are both included in verse 24. There are numerous other passages in the Bible that Christ did, died uh, for many and not all. We will go through some of these passages in more detail. <clears throat> Matthew twenty twenty eight. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Hebrews 9, 5. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. Mark ten forty five. And for this cause he is the mediator of a new testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9, 5. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9, 28. 
He that is of God heareth God's word. She therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Romans 8, 48. Be of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. John 8, 44. These are just a few passages of scripture that show that Christ had has a particular or specific group of people for whom he came into the world to give salvation for as a free gift. As has been pointed out many times throughout this book, the only way anyone is going to hear God's word and embrace us and subscribe to it is if that person is born again by the Spirit of God and given spiritual life from above. Then their eyes are opened and their spiritually deaf ears can hear the truth portrayed in God's word. Chapter 7 Free will against unfailing grace and eternal life. <clears throat> when Christ said he would give eternal life <clears throat> to his people, that is exactly what he meant. He did not say temporary life or conditional life. <clears throat> as long as you measure up to my expectations or the, po uh, or the possibility of eternal life. No, he was very clear. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 39-40 The Apostle Paul says virtually nothing can separate the elect from the love of God. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are counted as sheep for the slaughter nay and all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us for I am persuaded that neither death nor life <clears throat> nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor Depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 35-39 The reason those who are pro promoting the false doctrine of free will attack the everlasting eternal life that Christ promised to give to his elect is that they are into work salvation. They are not resting in the finished work of Christ and what he accomplished on the cross when he said it is finished. No, they want to add a long laundry list of works necessary for a person to be saved, including church membership, uh, baptism, partaking of the sacraments, and many other man-centered works. The Apostle Paul warned about those coming in preaching any other gospel, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the gospel, the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preaching any other gospel unto you, and that which we have preached unto you, let it be accursed. And, and as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, chapter 8. George Whitfield and Wesley, John Wesley and Augustus Toplady. The 18th century revival in England, often called the Great Awakening, was conducted by George Whitfield and John Wesley, all they, though they cooperated for a time, doctrinal conflict became apparent because they were not preaching the same gospel. Whitfield said of Wesley's teaching, sad terrors have been sown here. It will require some time to pluck them up. The doctrine of the gospel, the doctrines of the gospel are sadly run down and most monstrous errors propagated. 
Whitfield wrote Wesley a letter in 1740 refuting his false teachings, and Wesley, Wesley's refusal to declare the doctrine of election and final perseverance when it is clearly taught in Scripture. He also rebukes Wesley for teaching that Christ died not only for those that are saved, but also for those that perish. Wesley's teachings were borrowed from many sources, but mainly were from the Anglo-Catholic tradition. He read many of the mystics. Methodism taught that anyone could be saved and denied reprobation. John Wesley also detested the teachings of Augustus Toplady and maligned him in every possible way. Wesley spread lies about Toplady even when he was at the point of death, and when Toplady became aware of it, he literally got up off of his deathbed and publicly refuted Arminianism and embraced the doctrines of grace once more. Even after Top Lady died, Wesley continued to besmirch the character of Top Lady. The only reason Wesley so hated Top Lady was because of his reputation on biblical grounds of the Arminianism of Wesley. We find the same thing happening today with those who are teaching the false doctrine of Arminianism and free will. They they will do everything possible to attack and line those who would express their lie uh, malign those who expose their lies in the light of biblical truth. The Apostle Paul exhorts us to preach the word be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust Shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables? But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Second Timothy 4, 2-5, through 5, chapter 9. Exposing the Lies of C.I. Schofield. C.I. Schofield married Leontine Carey, and they lived in Atchison, Kansas. He deserted Leontine Carey and his two daughters, leaving them virtually no support for his mistress, whom he also abandoned, and eventually married another woman, Helen Van Ward Schofield. Helen Van Ward Schofield was constantly involved in underhanded fraudulent activities, which eventually led him being charged with criminal forgery and sent to prison. Schofield was involved with the Zionist Samuel Uttermeyer, Uttermeyer introduced Schofield to a number of other Zionists who ended up financing Schofield and his activities, including trips to Oxford and paying for the publication and distribution of his Schofield Reference Bible. Schofield's Reference Bible was promoted to reinforce the rebuilding of the Jewish temple and to renew animal sacrifices. Schofield lied about having a Doctor's of Divinity degree and called himself Dr. Schofield. Since Schofield's death, <clears throat> the reference Bible has gone through several changes. Pro-Zionist notes were added to generate support by the churches for the state of Israel. For more information on this subject, visit uh, sermonaudio.com forward slash house church and listen to the message if you are supporting the state of Israel, you are supporting Luciferian doctrine. All of the Jews are not God's chosen people. If that were the case, they would all be embracing and trusting Jesus as their Messiah. Most, Jesus is, most Jews hate Christ and embrace the Babylonian Talmud and the Kabbalah, which is satanic. When Schofield's reference Bible came on the scene, it was immediately welcomed and promoted by the free will churches. It has become a mainstay in many of the so-called fundamentalist churches, and is accepted as the truth. This movement, uh, when it is full of lies perpetrated by, perpetrated by Schofield and, the Zion, and his Zionist friends. This movement, and that is what it was, and is merely use, uses deception to promote its causes, which is the further propagation of Zionism. 
For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the leather, who, whose praise is not of men but of God, Romans 2, 28 through 29. Now we find the government of the United States and most of our political leaders had bought into the Zionist movement, resulting in billions of dollars going into the coffers of the state of Israel. Chapter 10, Exposing the Lies of the Holiness Movement, Charles Finney and Dwight L. Moody. In the first part of the 19th century, the Holiness Movement infiltrated both the United States and Europe. The theology of pragmatism became the norm rather than the authority of of the Bible. Charles Finney lived from 1792 to 1875 and created a concept in evangelism called decisionism. There are no altar calls found in the New Testament. In his day, Finney carried a lot of influence. Some have described him as the icon of modern evangelism or evangelicalism. Jerry Falwell of the Moral Majority said that Fanny was one of my heroes and a hero to many evangelicals, including Billy Graham. One of his most famous messages was sinners bound to change their own hearts. Scripture is clear that because a person is born dead in trespass and sin, he is unable to do anything in the spiritual nature. Only the Holy Spirit can breathe spiritual life into a dead sinner. Fanny's tactics included the anxious seat and the mourner's bench, which led to the invitation of altar call, which is now the norm for most free will churches of today. Finney used schemes that led to feigning and weeping to play on people's emotions. The idea was that by using the right tactics was the important thing that worked. Work taking away from the supernatural work of God, Finney denied the doctrine of original sin and the doctrine of justification and put it in place man's free will. Dwight L. Moody was a great promoter of the free will gospel as well. He and Ira D. Sankey, the gospel singer and hymn writer, conducted huge evangelistic meetings in Scotland where thousands made professions as to believing in Christ. They also held meetings throughout Britain playing upon people's emotions rather than ascribing to the doc to the doctrine of the Bible and in fact was an enemy of the truth. These teachings ignore God as the lawgiver and ignored the sovereignty and power of God in the dispensation of his grace. The fact that Moody's teaching appealed to the masses and his absence of sound doctrine shows the reality of the emphasis on man and not the glory of God. Chapter 11, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, A Turning to Rome. On March 29, 1994, a very remarkable event took place that would change the nature of the relationship of the so-called Christian community throughout the world. A group of 20 leading so-called Christian leaders and 20 Roman Catholics signed the Joint Declaration of Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian mission in the third millennium. This was a dialogue that began with Richard John Newhouse, a Catholic priest in New York, and Charles Colson. These two men brought together a group of well-known theologians and religious leaders, including Bill Bright of Campus Crusade for Christ, Pat Robertson, a Christian broadcaster, James I. Packer, Larry Lewis of the Southern Baptist Convention, Jesse Miranda of the Assemblies of God, John White of the Geneva College, and on the Catholic side, Cardinal John O'Connor and Avery Dulles. This activity was under the monitoring of the head of Rome's powerful council for promoting Christi Christian unity, uh, Jesuit Cardinal Idris Cassidy. As former Roman Catholic priest and author Richard Bennett aptly described in his book Catholicism East of Eden, quote, the devastating effect of the new evangelical compromise with the gospel is to put a stop to evangelizing of Roman Catholics across the world. If this compromise of the truth of the gospel of Christ is accepted, then Bible-believing churches 
will refrain from evangelizing Catholics, end quote. The Evangelicals and Catholics Together document sought about to bring unifying language describing the so-called gospel between Evangelicals and the Roman Catholics. These efforts had a terrible negative impact on what had been a clear distinction between the two groups, causing deception and tearing down and apart the very work of God. By all these evangelicals giving their approval to this document, they were putting their approval on Roman Catholic teachings. This ecumenical nightmare will ultimately bring the Protestant churches under the authority of the Pope of Rome. Scripture tells tells us clearly ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils 1 Corinthians 10 23 chapter 12 Dr. James Dobson and focus on the family the very name of the organization focus on the family gives us some insight in the beliefs and the false doctrines presented by Dr. James Dobson. The focus is not on the gospel of Christ. It is the focus on the individual or group of individuals. That is, the family. Dobson has always promoted the doctrine of self-esteem and free will. Dobson has been a long subscriber of the Nazarene Church that endorses the doctrine of John Wesley. Dobson has also promoted the doctrine of self-esteem and free will. He puts man on the throne of not only his own destiny by his choices, but he also puts man on the throne as it relates to his eternal salvation. Even though Dobson is basically retired from running the focus on the family, the organization, he has had a tremendous impact on the United States and churches here and around the world. It is no wonder today's generation is known as the me generation. Dobson brought into the psycho garbage from the get-go by trying to merge the Bible with psychology. Never can the two be married. It's like mixing oil and water. Christ said you cannot serve God and mammon. No man can serve two masters, for he either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. <clears throat> Matthew 6.24 Why was Dobson and his focus on the family so well received by the free will church as well? It should be obvious. He he endorsed secular education by his own practices and doctrines. He subscribed to man-centered psychology over the word of God. He taught and preached the doctrine of free will. And that man can determine his own success in life by his own choices. He visited Vatican and the Pope and drank the Kool-Aid of the Roman Catholic Church. This is just one more example of marketing humanism under the guise of calling your organization a Christian one. Chapter 13, Billy Graham, the Southern Baptist Convention and the megachurches. Billy Graham had done, has done more to attack the true gospel than most false teachers and preachers combined. He has promoted the false free will gospel across the world and at stadiums in the United States in front of thousands and thousands of people. Billy Graham has stated that he adheres to the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church and has set, sent many who have attended his campaigns right back into the whorish false church. His Hour of Decision broadcast highlights his focus on the free will of man and not on the election and sovereign grace of God. Literally thousands of people exalt Billy as a great preacher and follower of Christ. There's even a statue of him in front of one of the Southern Baptist churches. He has been a huge advocate of ecumenism and is bringing, every, uh, bringing everyone under a one world church. He teaches a conditional salvation 
and that Jesus loves everyone without any exception, and he made it possible that all might be saved. He has accepted an honorary degree from a Catholic university and has exalted the Pope as being a great spiritual leader on numerous occasions. Charles Finney was a hero of Billy Graham, and he considered him to be another great spiritual leader doing the service of God. Billy Graham's national campaigns helped justify and usher in the megachurches with their similar methods to his. Billy likes to pull in well-known sports figures and entertainers to draw large crowds. He loves appealing to the widest possible audiences. The megachurches of today and their leaders like Rick Warren, Bill Hybels, T.D. Jakes, John Hagee, the former Chuck Smith, Paula White, Joyce Myers, and Kenneth and Gloria Copeland are just a few examples of those who merely mirrored the false free will doctrine propagated by Billy Graham and the Southern Baptist Convention. Chapter 14, Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Lies. Back in 2007, I purchased Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. I was really amazed at how blatant and obvious was he was with his exaltation of the creature. Warren's philosophy was man-centered, that is, what man can do to determine his own destiny by his own choices. To further review the absolute heresy of what the man is teaching, go to sermonaudio.com forward slash uh, uh, sermonaudio.com forward slash house church and listen to the sermon on Rick Warren. He uses a slick marketing to not only promote Saddleback Church but to suck in hundreds of other churches into his man center schemes. He now is promoting a plan for purpose-driven countries. This is nothing more than placing man on the throne and removing God from his throne. This is a total denial of the teachings of divine authority in all things, including in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Ephesians 1.11 Rick Warren's association with the Southern Baptist Convention is further evidence of the doctrinal errors upheld by the Southern Baptist Convention by continuing with open arms, welcoming Rick Warren into their fold. <clears throat> Much more could be said about the man-centered philosophies of Rick Warren, but suffice it to say he is preaching and teaching another gospel. Chapter 15. It is often hard to get people to agree on what the true gospel really is. We are, be, we are to be ready to give an answer to anyone regarding our faith. That is, 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The most standard answer that most people giving regarding the gospel is the lie that Jesus loves everybody and he died for the sins of the whole world. The first lie is that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. He did not die for every man, woman, boy, and girl without exception. Scripture tells us that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. If Christ died to save everyone from their sins, then there would be no sinners that would go to hell, for Christ's sacrifice on the cross would have canceled their sin debt. The reprobate sinner is going to die in an unforgiven state. The next lie is that Christ died to make it possible for all men to go to heaven. We used to sing the song, When We All Get to Heaven. The song goes on to say, What a day of rejoicing that will be. The only ones that are going to go to heaven and those who are those who have been recipients of God's grace and been chosen by God from the foundation of the world. The gospel is the glad tidings of the good word of the Lord to all for whom Christ died. All men were born and conceived in sin, but scripture tells us in John six thirty seven to forty seven All the Father have given me will come to me, and he that come to me I will in no wise cast out. If you are one of those for whom the Father has given the Son before creation, then you are also a recipient of His grace. And this is called unconditional election. Unconditional election is an unmerited favor of God. 
By grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2.8 Particular redemption is not a potential redemption, but an accomplished and applied redemption through the precious blood of Jesus. These people have been elected, predestinated, chosen, and effectually called. This is where the theme of the death, the burial, and the resurrection comes into the picture because Christ did not say to uh, give up Uh, Christ did not stay. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. These people have been elected, predestinated, chosen, and eventually called. This is where the theme of the death, the burial, and the resurrection comes into the picture because Jesus did not stay in the grave, but rose up out of the grave. The Apostle Paul said that if Christ had not risen from the dead, we would be yet in our sins. Another part of the gospel is called irresistible grace. It's an absolute certainty that all for whom Christ died will come to Christ and believe the true gospel. The biblical gospel, according to the Apostle Paul, can be found in Romans 8, which I refer to as the golden chain of salvation, beginning in the 26th verse we read, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn, of many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 8, 26-36. This straightforward presentation by the Apostle Paul includes all the crucial doctrinal points of the gospel, including the law of sin and death, that is man's depravity, unconditional election, effectual calling, particular redemption, and irresistible grace, and the final perseverance of the saints. I hope that this short book has served to exalt our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his completed work for his people. I also pray that everyone who reads it will be built up in full assurance of the faith which originates from God alone. God bless Larry Phillips. And then I have listed suggested reading The Anti-Gospel by Edward Henry, The Sovereignty of God by Arthur W. Pink, and the authorized King James Version of the Bible. And that concludes the reading of the book The Lies of Free Will. And this sequence of course is chapter 6 through 15. God bless.